Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Friends, we need to pray that God, by the Spirit, might lead us into his truth. That he might make known his mind to us with real clarity of what we've just read. In particular, the clarity that relates to the precious gift of marriage. Even if you've been married for many years, maybe decades, I qualify for um, There is something for all of us in here that God might help even those of us who've been married for a long time to come to an understanding at a new level. It's possible. We haven't learned everything there is to know. That when he does challenge us and convict us as we come to his truth that we won't resist him in our hearts but that we would ask God now to help us have hearts that are submissive to him and embrace what he actually tells us to be and to do in our families. So let's pray together. We do need to pray. Let's ask for his help. Almighty God, as we come to you this morning as your people, we are so grateful that you do not leave us to struggle in darkness, to try and work out how best of our lives. Oh, how kind you have been to us as your people, clearly revealing to us how to live in a way that will glorify you, and how to live in a way that will even bring us immense blessing and true happiness. Father, For many of us, we can actually say, thanks be to your name, that in the past you have given us light. And though we know we have not lived perfectly, Lord, you know our hearts. And you know we have sought to live according to the measure of light that you have given. And we want to ask you, Lord, that you would even give us more light today and that ongoing determination to live in the light that you give. So bless, we pray, and do your work amongst us, that it may bring glory to your name and shower much blessing upon our marriages, upon our families, upon our church, and even upon our nation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend who, as a child, lived in Scotland. And he loved to play in the fields. He loved to to paddle in the the streams near his home. But he and his friends learnt very quickly never to look from the stream below the point where the cattle came and stood. For obvious reasons. Because the cattle fouled the water with their hooves and their manure. My friend had a a secret spring where he and his buddies drink from. It was a spot inaccessible to those beasts. And you could imagine it was one of those treasured places in childhood. Well, friends, I want to suggest to you as we come to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, we come to one of those pure streams. 
Because here we find a precious place from which we can, can drink and be refreshed in otherwise confusing and wearisome days. For how the world, the flesh and the devil have fouled the crystal stream of scripture regarding marriage and the family. The philosophies of this age have fouled God's precious provision of the lifelong union of a man and a woman in a covenant of companionship. Him leading in love, her following with a and a quiet spirit. And yet how even unfaithful shepherds have been influenced by the world's thinking and they have driven many of God's sheep through God's pure stream of truth and they have muddied the way, trampling effectively on the word of God. More concerned perhaps to accommodate their thinking and practice to the ways of the world than they are to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When speaking to unfaithful shepherds in Israel, God says in Ezekiel 34 verse 19, A flock, they eat what you have trampled, and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Friends, in these days, we want to leave the foul waters, and we want to go upstream, as it were, into the clear spring of God's truth, where we can drink God's uncontaminated waters of pure revelation. To have our thirst for God's ways in marriage and family satisfied again. And that will mean our need to put aside the muddy ways of this world and to be refreshed in the sweet spring of God's blessing of the closest of human relationships on the planet. We've been, aren't we, at a time when the waters really are muddied. Even in Christian circles, in terms of a clear understanding of the role and function of men and women in the family. You see, even we need to drink again the clear stream of Scripture, because this is the place, friends, of clarity. This will clarify and help if there's confusion. This is the place of refreshment in the midst of the weariness of the philosophies of this age. And so this morning, as we come back to a five, and we take up our study again from verse 22, we're going to consider what I'm simply calling today God's pattern for the wife. And there are three things that I want us to think about. It's slightly different to what I announced last week at the outset where I thought we were going, but it's... Those three things are the mud on submission, the motive for submission, and then the model of submission. The mud, the motive, and the model. Firstly then, the mud on Submission. As we know, as I just mentioned, we are living at a time when God's reveals, revealed ways for marriage and the family have been terribly muddied by the philosophies of this world. And so that's why we need to turn as Christians to Ephesians 5, a crystal clear passage. But, but lest we think that the struggles that we might be experiencing in our culture with marriage and the family is unique to our time, I want to very briefly outline how muddied the waters actually were in Paul's... Those words that we began to look at last week in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands. The next major section of the passage, which we'll get to. Husbands, love your wives. Those, those perspectives, those directives from not just countercultural for us today, they are, but not just that. They were very shocking and countercultural words for the Ephesian Christians as well. You see, women living in the first century culture were very much, if you like, living in the mud 
But yet that man, when the gospel came, when the gospel of grace came with all of its purity and all of its power, it gave to these early Christian women a level of dignity and honour their culture knew nothing about. You see, let me explain. The Jews in the tree had a pretty low view of women. To them, in many ways, women were nothing much better than a slave in their thinking. Some of you have heard the, the morning prayer that often a Jewish man would pray. And it was something like this. God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. I thank you that I'm not a slave. And I thank you, God, that I'm not a woman. It was a prayer that they prayed. They didn't have a very high regard or care for women. And, see, and that Jewish attitude was evident in their view of marriage, evident in particular in their view of easy divorce. They latched on to Moses' accommodation of divorce in Deuteronomy 24 on the grounds of uncleanness. The thing was that they took that term uncleanness very loosely in a way that was never intended and that opened up a way for easy divorce. There were actually two schools of thought into this and I mentioned this, I think it was only last Lord's Day in relation to the other reading. And those two schools were one conservative and one liberal, if you like. And the more conservative idea was where, where divorce was only possible due to adultery, that was uncleanness. The popular, the more popular and the liberal view saw uncleanness as almost anything. So, men, if it was that your wife didn't put enough salt in your beef casserole, then she could be seen in your eyes as unclean. And you could write out a certificate of divorce and you could discard her. If you saw her talking to other men in the town, if she spoke in a way that you were not happy about that related to your mother, which was her mother-in-law, you could write out a certificate of divorce and you could discard her. She was unclean. And some went even so far as the husband found another woman who was prettier. That made his wife look unclean. He therefore had grounds to remove that first wife and go for the more prettier one and have her. You see, by Paul's day, the Jews were divorcing their wives almost at will. What a horrible way. What a horrible way to treat women. And when this passage, think then, when this passage came to the church in Ephesus and Jewish people who were converted, when they read this, they saw that this was actually liberating for women, not oppressive. Now in the first century, it was actually a Greco-Roman in culture, the, the, the general world I'm talking about now. And the Gentile Christians in the church at Ephesus had been converted out of that culture. And these early Christians, they themselves needed to drink the pure stream about marriage from this passage to help them come the wrong attitudes that were in their culture about marriage, about women and about the family. And the reason why is because the pagan Greek culture and its attitude to women and marriage was even worse than the Jews. In fact, there was no legal procedure for divorce in Greek society since wives were simply seen who cleaned the house and bore legitimate children. Men were regarded as having the freedom to seek their own sexual pleasure outside of marriage and therefore they didn't bother to even divorce their wives. We're all familiar that Paul often uses a word in the New Testament in English, cation. it's the Greek word pornea. Fornication was very common in Greek culture. The Greek word pornei means a woman for sale. The Greek word pornos means a man for sale. In other words, male and female prostitution was common to the Greek culture. Historians, interestingly, have noted that in the Athenian society, pedophilia was very common. And we know that from what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that homosexuality was not uncommon as well. And so prostitution, homosexuality, lesbianism, paedoph paedophilia, they abounded in the Greek world. That was the world these Christians lived in. The Greek culture. 
Now, in terms of the Roman world, because Rome, if you like, was the political power at that time, even over the area of Asia Maya, where Ephesus was, when it comes to women, when it comes to the Roman world, we find more muddied and contaminated waters. Some of you would have perhaps heard of the, the ancient writer Jerome. Well, he actually tells of one Ro- Roman woman who married her 23rd husband. And she was his 21st husband wife. Marriage in Roman times often was nothing more than legalized prostitution. And it was actually a strong women's liberal movement in the Roman world. Women didn't want to have children because it could affect the appearance of their bodies. Some wanted even to, to, as women to do everything that men do. Sound familiar? And in that Roman world, they would even want to be developing women wrestlers, women sword throwers and so on. We do know as we look at our Bibles from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that there was, if you like, a first century feminism movement and that had affected some of the Christians thinking in that church on the issue of male headship and the role of women as it worked itself out culture on the issue of head coverings. Friends, in this brief survey of the cultural times of these early Christians, we can certainly see, can't we, how muddied and committed the waters actually were and how these Christians needed themselves to go upstream to find the the pure spring of God's truth. And so we see how Countercultural. These words were in Paul's day. And we know, I don't think I have to persuade you on this, we've discussed it even last week in the adult class, we know that these sort of things, these perspectives, they are countercultural in our day. Just this last week we've heard, haven't we, on the news, about legislation passed in, in England to, to legalise homosexuality. Now, isn't it interesting that the media would report on a piece of legislation passed in England this last week? But the week before, they didn't tell us what legislation passed in their parliament. But they thought it was important for us to know about that piece of legislation in this country on the other side of the world. We get an idea of an agenda, don't we? A counter-cultural perspective to God's. We also know how Our culture is almost really over the top in their political correctness and we need to watch out almost that the not the personal computer but the politically correct police are not catching us up in using those terrible words like mankind that somehow is not politically correct. That's our culture. And so not only was this countercultural in that day, we know it's countercultural in our day. And so we need to go upstream to drink the, 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 the pure truth of God's word. And so what have we seen? Let me just very briefly, for those of you who are not here last week, we touched on the issue, two things. We touched you of the matter of submission. Remember, the word here in verse 21, uh, submitting to one another, then read into verse 22, wives submit. That word submit has the idea of voluntarily uh, being in a place of self-subjection. It's not speaking of slavery. It's not speaking about a person being crushed. It's voluntarily self-subjection. And that direction, as we saw, comes in the broader context of the Bible of a loving marriage. That's the context of it. Of a covenant of companionship. Not dipship. Companionship. And that the wife's submission in this very passage here is presented in the marital context of a husband loving that lady like Jesus and the church. And yet, of course, we wrestled something with Peter, what, what if the husband doesn't lead as he should? Does that excuse me from submitting? We also thought about the manner of her submission. How is she to submit? 
And we highlighted four things. Let me just briefly remind you of what they are. She is to have a submissive heart in the first place to Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear or the reverence of God. Secondly, she is to be that one who is being filled with the Holy Spirit for the simple reason it is only by Christ's strength that a wife could ever be able to do these things directed here. Third, to look to Christ to follow his example that we saw in 1 Peter chapter 2, how he even submitted himself even to cruel men. And fourthly, she is to submit to her husband by doing it to the Lord because Paul says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. This morning we move forward. We're going to drink further, I hope, from what Paul goes on to say. Look now with me at verse 23 as we think of the motive for submission. We'll read verse 22 and 23 together. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for... There's a connection here. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Now, what is the motivation that Paul puts before us here in this passage? What's the motivation for the wife's submission? For, he says, the husband is head of the wife. Here, friends, we have God not vaguely, Not in a confusing way. We have God clearly revealing the pattern for marriage. This is how God has designed it. And do you notice in this verse how he seems to refer to an analogy? He speaks about the head and he speaks about the body. Did you pick that up? For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church and he is saviour of the body. How has he designed the human body? Well, he has so arranged things, has he not, that the head takes the lead. You notice that lately? (laughs) The body follows the direction that comes from the head. That's not in any way degrading to the body. However, the body doesn't respond to its head. That would be degrading. Actually, that would be confusing. Actually, that would be absolutely disastrous for that body wouldn't it and so Paul is saying wives submit to your husbands why what's the motivation for the husband head of the wife now I'm well aware that sometimes people get smart here and perhaps the tongue is in the cheek when they say and perhaps maybe you've said this well yes he's my head but I'm the neck that turns the head I mean, he may say he's in charge, but everyone really knows who runs the show around here. I'm the neck that turns the head. Well, that's rather clever, isn't it? Is it? Is it as clever as it first sounds? Think about it. For in the end, the only reason the neck turns is why? Is because the head tells it to turn. And what chaos we would have if the neck simply did its own thing. You see, friends, there is a lesson here with the analogy, I think. For we all know what it would be if we saw a body, a human body, that did not respond to the head. We would certainly see something chaotic. Physically, that person would basically be dysfunctional. The same is for biblical marriage. Where a wife does not submit, there will always be distortion and there will be dysfunction in that relationship. And one of the tragic results that flows from it is not just trouble in the husband wife relationship, is it? But the children, think of them. They live in that home too. And they will have a clear example being played out before them day in and day out what a lack of submission actually looks like in practice. And so why should those parents prized if when those children grow and enter teenage years and enter into those young people periods and they display her very spirit? 
It will, we know it does, create all sorts of pain and all sorts of problems. Where did that... Well, yes... It rose up in the first place in their own hearts as sinners. Absolutely it did. But in many cases, they also have actually had a pattern put before them for years of a mother rebelling against God and his appointed, God-appointed head. Do you think that through, friends? If a, if a wife, is a wife, she deliberately keeps things from her husband so that she might manipulate him and take on a role of being in control. So perhaps she tells her children not to tell daddy those things and she begins to herself up as a de facto head, could we say. Plus, what's she also doing? She is training those children how to be deceivers, how to be manipulators. That reminds me of what Rebecca did for her son Jacob. And we know the consequences of that. What else would be happening in that setting? She's actually molding selfish children who will grow into adults who will always struggle with always wanting to get their own way all the time because that's that what they have only ever known. Now where can some of that start in the family? Well, it can start with a wife. It's lack of submission to her Lord and her husband. So there are some of the dangers, I guess, but let's flip side and state it positively. When the wife does follow God's way, then what do we see? We, we, we see a family with the sweet and the blessing of God. God's smile, not just on the wife, not just on the husband, but God blessing even that whole family unit. And in the end, the whole family unit's health largely boils down to the health of the relationship between that husband and that wife. I know there are exceptions, but overall I believe these are the patterns. A human body not following the head will only ever lead to distortion, destruction and dysfunction. God has so designed the human body to receive head. The husband is head of the wife. God has so designed the wife to respond to the leadership of her man. And when she does that, there is sweet, sweet blessing. And you see buried in the very expression itself that Paul is laying before these Christians here, laying before us, uh, is is a motivation enough, is it not, to obey this directive? This is God's design. And yet every time we think we've got a better way, we soon soon enough, we don't actually have a better way. And yet we follow the ways of God. We walk in His way and what do we discover? We discover that God's ways are always best, that we can't actually improve on His ways, that our wisdom is not wiser than His and that if we walk in this, there's no sweet smile in the marriage and that will also spill over into the life of the family. And so we need then to see what this motivation is that is placed before us in this passage. Let's move thirdly to consider the model of submission. And I struggled here in my own preparation to try and make this as simple as possible and divide this up to help you see these truths. But there are, there is overlap here, friends. There is overlap between the motivation and the model. So these things, in a sense, are going Together, and yet we do see a model put before us. Who is the pattern or who is the model to follow in the wife's submission to her husband? Let's come back to the text in verse 23 and 4. It says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands, in everything. Well, what is Paul saying here? Well, I think he's actually saying quite a lot. Obviously, the husband is likened to Christ, right? That's, that's right there on the surface. The wife is likened to the church, and as we know, as we've seen, she is sub- to submit to her head. But what about that reference at the end of verse 23 
to the Saviour. I want you to think about this. In what sense is the husband Saviour to the wife? You say, whoa, a heresy here. Well, let's clarify things. Certainly Christ is the only true Saviour. There is only one mediator between God and man. It is the man Christ Jesus. So understand that, right? That's a given as we read this passage. He is true Saviour in the sense of our souls and eternity. And could we say that that is Saviour with a big S or with a capital S if we would write it down? But could it not also be that Paul is saying, not just in Christ alone, but it's in the context of comparing Christ with the husband, the church with the wife. Could it not also be that Paul is saying that the husband is saviour to his wife? That is a saviour in a certain sense, in a salvation sense of eternity and soul. We know that. But a saviour in the sense of not a capital S, but a small letter S? William Hendrickson, one of the faithful commentators I often use, says this, just one one little line, he says, He, as her head, is vitally interested in her welfare. He is her protector. His pattern is Christ, who, as head of the church, is its saviour. You think, friends, God has designed it that the loving husband is to be so deeply concerned for his wife's welfare that it is patterned after the sacrificial interest of Christ in his church, which he purchased, as the verse says, with his own blood, and he continues to sanctify his bride. That's what he does as head who is functioning as saviour of the body. And so the wife is to submit to her husband as her head, yes, just as Christ, as the church submits to Christ, but doing it with an awareness that my husband is protector. My husband, not somebody else's, my husband is my provider. My husband is my preserver. My husband is my small s saviour. The Christian husband who who loves and leads like Christ will save his wife from her needs and dangers, won't he? So it's saving in a small s. He, He will be her loving human rescuer in a spot of danger. He will be one who is a protector from her, who is a preserver throughout life when they are together. He'll be deeply concerned about all her needs, including her relationship to Christ, men, and her growth in grace. And so you see, the Christian wife ought to view her husband as her spiritual guardian, her spiritual protector, her source of safety, provision, and blessing. Not just this, oh, well, head, dictator guy, got to do what I'm told, it's my duty. No, there's a richness here. You see this, ladies, this is more motivation for you as a wife to submit to your husband. Now, for all of that, that, if all of that's going to happen, that is based upon the assumption, husbands, that we are the men that God expects us to be. And so though the focus here is primarily on the wives, We can't think about the wives understanding and fulfilling their role without to some degree considering our role as husbands. So husbands, let me just raise a few questions for you to mull over about your role as a small s saviour in your... Is your wife, your wife, the one that God gave to you... Is your wife growing in love for God and others because of you, because of your leadership, because of your care for her? Is she making greater progress in holiness because of you as her head? Or are you often a hindrance to her growing in holiness? 
Is she developing in her Christ-like graces because of you, like developing, as we spoke of last week, in that gentle and quiet spirit? Or is it often that as a man, you are so brash and you actually provoke her rather than help her with a gentle and quiet spirit? Are you helping her in the area of modesty and discretion as her husband and her head and her care and her provider and her protector? Is your wife making progress in her realm of work? For instance, is she becoming a better homemaker because of you and your encouragement of her in the role or do you just take it for granted? Is your wife blossoming in her walk with God? Is is she growing in her understanding? Can you actually say, my wife is now understanding things. She is now reading Christian books uh, that she would never have read some years ago. Is that happening? Because you have had import, your sanctifying, sacrificial and loving leadership has had a big bearing on that progress? Or has she had to do it all on her own? You see, anyone can say, I do. But men, are we doing these things? Are we doing these things as husbands? And I'm saying to myself as well, are we pursuing these things so that our wives actually know that it is the safest place for them to be in submission to our loving headship? <coughs> Could it be, man, that the reason you don't or you can't do some of those things that I've just raised is because you're not actually saved? And you can never be the husband that your wife needs you to be until in the first place you are right with God through Jesus Christ. And even we who are Christian husbands, we can never be the man that our wife needs us to be unless we are right with God and walking. So it's not just about the wives as we spoke of last week and their submission boils down to their submission to Christ in verse 21. It's about us as well, men. It's about our relationship in the first place with Christ as well. Now, lady, questions that I actually that I raise, if they actually do describe something of your husband, then praise God for that. You've got a gem. I mean that. Some of you do. You have every reason. And you have motivation why you should submit to him. What a gift God has given for you. But if he is not all that you want him to be, then don't nag him. Pray for him. Encourage him. And help him along. Nudge him along. There's a difference between nudge and nag, I think. Help him along and help him to see and remind him of his role and encourage him in that task. And you look to the Lord Jesus as the wife, for he ultimately is your great model. Be filled with his spirit, remember. And you submit to that man as the Lord. And so as we think of the model, we're thinking of our Lord Jesus in terms of Saviour and what that means in relation to the husband. But what else is said here in verse 24? Let's hone in as we bring our study to a conclusion this morning. Verse 24, what is Therefore, so he's, he's coming, if you like, to a point of conclusion of what he's just said. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in a couple of things. <laughs> in everything. Now we covered that everything really last week. If you've got to obey God rather than men, you've got an out clause. But in most cases, that's not really the case. But it's still an out clause. Okay, so we understand the everything in the context of what we spoke last week. But what's the model here? What's he saying? Just as the church submits, 
Wives, submit. That's what he's saying. Just as the church submits, so you wives make sure you submit to your husbands in everything. Now let me ask you a question. How would you describe that submission in relation to the church and Christ? Think of that model. Just as the the church submits to Christ, so let the wives submit to Christ. So how does the church do it? Well, surely the submission of the Christ is voluntary. It is wholehearted. It is sincere. And it is enthusiastic. Yes, this side of glory, it's not perfect. But I think those four things cover it largely. It is voluntary. It is wholehearted sincere and it is enthusiastic. It's not some sort of pretend job. It's not like, well, okay, this is my duty. I've got to be seen to be obeying my husband and following him, so I better do it. Is that how the church submits to Christ? Really? No, it's true. It's real. Why? Because it springs from a renewed heart. It springs from deep within. So in the first place, it's not about just doing the duty. Yep, I wash the dishes, I, 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 I own, iron his clothes, I get the food on the table on time. No, if that's your thinking, then you've missed it. In the first place, it's about the heart. It's about the heart for the church to Christ. Does the church submit to Christ just out of duty? No, the church submits to Christ out of love is the key. It's a loving submission in return for Christ's love to her. We sang it before, 1 John 4, very clear. We love him because he first loved us. And so Paul says... Let the same be true for wives to their husbands. Submit to him just as the church submits to Christ. The church submits to Christ in love. The wife is to submit to her husband in love. You not see, Christian wife, what wonderful motivation this is actually for you to submit to your man? And I do believe many of you can say, that the man that God has given to be my head, he has my welfare, he has my best interests at heart, so I will gladly, I will voluntarily submit to his leadership and his care for me. So I know, more than anybody on the face of this earth, I know he is not perfect, but yet I also know more than anybody on the face of this earth, I know his heart. And I know he wants to see me grow in Christ desires by the grace of God to be my protector, to be my provider, to be my preserver. And I'll gladly submit to him. Yes, I can see it clearly here in the passage that I should follow the pattern as a wife just as the church submits to Christ out of love, in sincerity, voluntarily and enthusiastically. How this world has muddied, contaminated these best friends. Completely creating a whole situation of a caricature that is just so far removed from the biblical picture. And how we need as Christians to be alert to that. To put our fingers in the ears. If you like, hear no evil, see no evil. And... Do no evil. Perhaps you say as a wife, yep, I can see the motivation for submission. I can see that in the passage. Thank you. I can see the the model for submission. Thank you, Lord. You've shown me that clarity this morning. But if I must be honest, I'm still struggling as to how this works itself out in practice in my situation. I'd like us to turn in closing to Titus chapter 2 because we find some practical helpings in Titus chapter 2 in relation to the area of a model. Some practical help here.
Titus chapter 2. Paul is outlining many things here in, in terms of relationships for older men, older women, younger women, younger men. He's touching on the servants here as well as he writes to Titus in, in the island of Crete and all the issues that have come to bear in that culture as well. That chapter 1 re- reveals as to how corrupt that culture was. And so is this, remember, this is countercultural in the day of Titus as well on the island of Crete. But here's a fresh stream. This is pure revelation. This is not something that has been uh, affected by some sort of uh, bias that people would say that Paul had. This is the word of God. Paul writes by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And so as Paul writes, God writes. God therefore says this. In Titus 2 verse 3, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not given to much wine. Okay, there are all the knots there after the positive thing of reverence. And now here are some positives. What are the older women to be? Teachers of good things. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, To be disgraced, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the word of God may not be blasphemed. So here God is saying that the older women are to conduct themselves in a godly way. Here they are. After their years of of family rearing are over. They can then take up a unique, precious role. (laughs) It's wonderfully positive and practical, this. They can take up this role of becoming teachers. Let's be careful with understanding the word and not read into that. Often is read into that that's not there. Let's get out of it only what the Spirit put in it. What does it say? It says, teachers of good things. Now the idea in that word is not so much formal instruction, it's not classes, it's not seminars and books as such, but it's more the teaching by one's life, the teaching by example, the the modelling of your word as the pattern, or it's this modern word, I think it's a helpful word here, it's the um, mentoring of others. God wants you who are older ladies to come alongside the younger mums, and to him to work out their role in practice. Paul is addressing the mature, godly women in the churches scattered across the island of Crete. These are the women who have a proven track record. And they are to embrace this ministry of encouragement. And there he is saying there are certain areas that the young mums really do need help with. They need encouragement with. And so that's why Paul uses that word there and when he says admonish, which is the idea of encourage, along other things, but encourage the young women. Now encourage the men. What's the list of specific practical areas that they had to come alongside and encourage the men? Well, encourage the young women to be husband lovers, to be children lovers, to be pure, to be self-controlled women now just at that point that is counter for us to be pure women to be self-controlled women in an age and a culture of self-indulgence that is counter-cultural <coughs> and then what does he say that the older women are to encourage the, are the, young, the younger mums in to be workers at home oh whoa that is counter-cultural isn't it it's biblical The older women are to be encouraging the younger men to be pursuing being workers in the home. Now notice as we get to the point of where we're coming, the older women alongside the younger women to help them with this last thing. What's this last thing to work out in practice? What's he say? Middle of verse 5. Obedient to their own Husbands. That word obedient, though it doesn't come out in the New King James, is actually the same word in the original that Paul uses back in Ephesians chapter 5. That's our word for... The older women 
are to come along and encourage you, come alongside and help them in a mentoring role to help the younger mums, the younger women in the life of those churches and even in, in, in our context here to be submissive to their own husbands. I want to bring this practical word to you ladies and an encouragement for the men to do the nudge the other way in this area. Older ladies, look for the ways to work this out. Have them over. Keep them in the park so the kids can play. <laughs> I don't know. And you can encourage them. You can pray with them. You can help them to love their husbands because some of us men at times are not that lovable. <laughs> you can help them to, to love their children because children are harder to love than others. You can encourage them to be pure. You can encourage them to be self-controlled. Help them to resist the incredible pressure that our world put, puts on with its subtlety now with Centrelink payments. We will not pay you unless you get back into the workplace before that child goes back into school. Help them to stay at home. That's what the Bible says. That's what God's direction is here. Encourage them as our focus is in these, in these days in our studies. To help them submit to their own husbands. Now, why? Why should you be doing that as a Christian older lady? What should motivate you? Yes, love. Yes, love. You, you struggled and you know you struggled and you don't want to see them struggle and you want to do all you can to help them. Yes, that's a righteous, righteous motive, but that's not the motive given to us here. The motive given to us in this passage. What is it at the end of verse 5? So that the word of God may not be blasphemed. You see, not to do some of those things listed in that passage undermines the word of God. To pick and to choose what you want to obey is to make a mockery out of the Bible. Do these things so that the word of God is, will not be dishonoured. Encourage them, as mature ladies, encourage them in this area so that the enemy has no cause, has no reason, occasion, to blaspheme. Is that not enough motivation? We want to see the ways of God upheld. We want God to be honoured and not there to be blasphemy. Young ladies, young men, oh, sorry, young mums in particular, I'm saying, let me encourage you to go your step and do your part if this sort of thing works itself out in practice. Why not? Take the initiative and actually ask one of the experienced ladies in this congregation who you respect, you've seen her children, she's got the runs on the board, why not invite her over and ask her for help? Ask her to pray with you regularly. It's God's way. God has provided wonderfully for you right here in the church. Practical help that you feel you need sometimes and you wonder, I feel alone, I struggle. Well, here God is telling, telling us a practical answer to some of your struggles. May God help all of us, all of us, men included, to leave our comfort zone and to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Whether we're wives or husbands, whether we're older or whether we're a young person, for us to get our head in the right direction as to what God actually wants for me in the future. Not just a head in the right direction, but to have a right heart in regard to these things as well. That we might all know under God, clearly from his Bible, what he wants us to be and what he wants us to to do. Friends, let's leave the muddied war of our world's thinking and let's drink in the blessings of God's ways that are outlined for us in this passage. Let's pray.